All right. Well, thank you so much to everyone for being here this evening at our Wish Cycling Workshop. We had a full registration list, so we're just really glad that you're here and excited that you're interested in this topic. We have a packed house and a packed lineup. We have a lot to fit into this hour presentation, so we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Kayla. I am one of our staff members here for the Solid Waste team. We actually have our whole team here today. You met Charlie when you were checking in, and Emily is going to be um, joining us in a moment to talk about some of the wish cycling education things that we want you to know about tonight. Our team oversees the city's recycling program and the implementation of the ordinances that we have in place to help reduce the amount of trash we throw away and we put together events throughout the year. We'll be talking about some of those tonight. Our agenda for this evening is First, we want to start with helping you understand what happens to your recyclables, just very briefly where they go. We'll talk about what wish cycling is and how it is different from recycling. We're going to talk about why it's a problem and what types of materials cause those problems and where you should put them instead. Slotted about 10 to 15 minutes for specific questions, and we're going to start out that time by allowing you to ask about specific items that you were maybe wondering about but didn't hear covered in the presentation. Our goal through our programs and our policies at the city is to reduce the amount of trash that's thrown away overall. However, we really want to make sure that through our education and communication to you all, that we're not sacrificing good quality recyclables um, just for the sake of keeping it out of the trash. We want to make sure that the right stuff is ending up in the right bins. I promised I'd tell you what happens to your recyclables. Um, the spoiler is that they aren't going in the trash. You may have heard some uh, headlines over the course of the last year or so, national headlines about recycling being in, in crisis, and there certainly are some issues with recycling markets globally, um, but the material that we collect through our program is recycled. It is sent to a recycling facility, and the state actually does not allow materials that you set out at the curb for recycling to be collected and then brought to like a landfill uh, as an example. It does have to be delivered to a facility that sorts it and markets it as a recyclable. In St. Louis Park, our curbside program, the recyclables are delivered to a material recycling facility, also known as a MRF, and that's what you'll hear us refer to it as. That's the place where your recyclables go. They're sorted, baled, and then sent to a manufacturer to be recycled into new products or sent to a secondary processor to be cleaned up a bit more before going to a uh, manufacturer for recycling. Ours goes to Waste Management's MRF in Minneapolis. Through our curbside program, there are several other MRFs throughout the Twin Cities that if you happen to live in an apartment or a multifamily building and your materials collected by a different hauler, not with the city, it would go to one of those facilities. Even though recycling has been in the news recently with news that there are issues with markets, here regionally in Minnesota and the surrounding states, we're a little bit more insulated from those global issues with recycling markets. The state of Minnesota has done a lot of work over the past several decades to build up local recycling markets and to support local manufacturers that take in recyclables and create new products. So we have a few examples of those up here. Let's talk about wish cycling, which is a catchy term, and I am going to hedge a bet that it might have been part of what got you interested in even coming at all, or you got dragged here by someone else who's interested in that term. Wish cycling is different than recycling. Recycling is the act of setting out items that are accepted by your local program to be collected and delivered to a MRF where it's collected, sorted, baled, and then sent on to a manufacturer that makes it into new products. There are existing markets for that material. Wish cycling, however, is the act of setting out other stuff 
that is not accepted by your local programs, but you're not quite sure if it is accepted or is not accepted, and you're really hoping that someone else will figure it out down the line. So you just throw it in anyways. The ugly truth is that wish cycling is actually just disguising your trash as recyclables. Why is that a problem? There are things set up in sorting facilities to be able to remove some contaminants and, and make sure that they're sorting and bailing the correct stuff. But material put into the cart that's not supposed to be there does cause issues. For the most part, we're going to focus on the three main issues that uh, those not accepted materials cause. The first is safety. There are employees at those sorting facilities that come into contact with recycling, with the recyclables. So some of the stuff that you put in there that is not supposed to be there can injure those employees. It can also destroy entire facilities. There are certain items that end up in the recycling that can cause fires that will, um, that will take down an entire facility. And we'll see a little bit more about that in a bit. Some of the things that we put in there cause operational issues and are a, a big headache and cost a lot of money in time down to remove items that shouldn't be there. And then lastly, some items are just contamination. They end up mixed in with the wrong things and they are next to impossible to remove and it results in lowering the value of the products that we really do want you to be putting in the bins. So. We are going to start with this short video. It's about three minutes, but it gives you a good idea of what wish cycling is and touches on a couple of a few of those main problem materials. Oh, thanks for the coffee. I hope it's strong because we've got a big day ahead of us. At Demcon, we process 20 tons of recyclables every hour, and single sort recycling bins make it easy for all of us to pitch in and do our part, if we know how to use them. We all want to help the planet by recycling, but recycling the wrong way negatively impacts our whole recycling program. Contamination makes the materials we collect less valuable, increasing the cost of our recycling programs. It can even cause valuable recyclables to be landfilled instead of being recycled. People often mean well when they toss this stuff in the bin, wishing we'll be able to recycle them. Unfortunately, this wish cycling makes recycling harder for everyone. Let's take a look at some of the unwanted items that Demcon deals with every day. And these are just a few examples. It's up to you to learn the rules for your community so you can help keep the recycling stream pure. One of the worst contamination culprits is something that we call tanglers. These stringy items like rubber hoses, Christmas lights, or metal hangers get all wrapped up inside our equipment and can cause serious damage. The same goes for plastic bags and plastic films that snarl and snag, building up until we have to shut the equipment down to cut them away. Another item that causes issues is shredded paper, which scatters like confetti, contaminating the other recyclables with pieces too small for us to remove. We also can't bail up your leftovers, so food and other heavily soiled items are unwelcome in the bin. Other troublesome contaminants that get sent our way include certain kinds of glass and ceramics, loose plastic bottle caps, and used diapers, blah, and disposable plastic coated coffee cups. Next time, try a reusable mug. In addition to hurting our equipment, wish cycling can actually hurt our people. Needles and syringes represent a serious health hazard, and unfortunately, they show up at our facility every day. Sharps need to be disposed of properly so they don't threaten the safety of the people who handle your waste and recyclables. The same goes for hazardous chemicals or gas cylinders. Thanks, but no thanks. But do you know who we consider the worst whisk cycling outlaw of all? That's right, the rechargeable batteries that power our gadgets can explode or start on fire while being transported or processed. This is a huge threat to our industry. Believe it or not, on average, the United States loses a recycling facility every month due to battery fires. So please, think about the hardworking folks who will be sorting through the items you recycle, and make sure you aren't exposing them to anything hazardous. And remember, just because you can't put something in the bin doesn't mean it can't be recycled. For example, food waste can be turned into compost, plastic bags can be recycled at most grocery stores, and national battery recycling programs have drop-off locations across the country. By learning how the recycling programs work in your community, you can make smarter decisions about what goes in the bin, what goes in the trash, and what other methods might exist for recycling. Thanks to smart recyclers like you, Minnesota has some of the highest recycling rates in the country. 
And we have a plan to push our recycling rates even higher. That's a goal we should all wish for and work toward by recycling the right way. Well, that was a great introduction and we're gonna go in depth, as he mentioned, more about kind of the specifics of different items. We have about two dozen items, all of which are on your sheet. I am actually gonna start with a couple of things that aren't on your sheet because they're more about preparation and not specific items. The first category of things are bagged recyclables. The most problematic are the ones that are in plastic bags, as you saw in that, we'll talk about plastic bags again. Plastic bags get wrapped around everything and they cause a huge mess. The other issue is that when things are in plastic bags, especially if they're tied closed, the employees do not have time to open those bags and get things out so they can actually be separated. So it generally happens, if you saw there was the one pla black plastic bags, that's the worst because they assume it's trash. They just pull the whole thing and it all goes down the garbage chute. So if you bag your recyclables, that is most likely what's going to happen. Paper bags are a little bit better, but as you can see in this photo here, this is actually from one of our sorts. What happens in the trucks, so the trucks that collect it, they compact the material, and sometimes when you have plastic and paper and aluminum all together, those things lock together, and when they get into the sorting facility, it's difficult for them to come apart. So it's better if things are all free. That helps ensure that they're not trapped inside of bags. So if you're currently collecting paper grocery bags just for sorting recyclables, we would encourage you to find something reusable and start using that instead, or at the very least, dump the recyclables and then put the bag in or reuse it again. We would like you to unbag it, otherwise it will become trash. The next category of items is tiny stuff. Uh, the big thing here is that there is, as you saw, there's a lot of moving pieces and some uh, different materials that are sorted out based on size. And they have this little picture up here shows an example of things that are too small. These green squares are two inch by two inch. They have a two inch trommel. It's a piece of equipment that sorts out the little stuff. And essentially anything that's two inch minus is what they call that, falls out and ends up as a contaminant in glass. So you can see in this barrel, this is from a sort we did, all these loose little items, tiny little bits, some of the stuff in there it wouldn't be recyclable anyway. Even if it was bigger, it could be but all of these small little bits just end up as a contaminant, especially in our glass. So we wanna make sure that all those small little pieces, I know it can be sad to, wanna throw all, to have to throw all these little things out, but all those small little pieces do need to go in the garbage. One exception is leaving the bottle caps on, which the gentleman mentioned in that video. If you keep the bottle caps on, they travel through the system correctly and will be sorted correctly and recycled correctly by the plastics folks. The other end of that is really big stuff. We occasionally see some really weird large things. This was actually a f swimming pool that someone folded and got in their recycling cart. Uh, we don't want this. It's a mix of things. It's an operational issue. As you can imagine in that system, big, huge things. Sometimes we see deck chairs and toys and all sorts of bicycles. We did a sort one time where there was a kid's bike in there. These things just they're too big for the system, and oftentimes they're not going to be the recyclable types of things anyway. These plastic things where they have mixed types of plastic, they're just not going to get sorted with the right things. So the big stuff, also a contaminant. It's also an operational issue. It's just it's a problem for them in their process. A few ideas instead is reusable items. Give them away. Donate them. Put them on the curb with a free sign. Uh, if it's a repairable item, something that's maybe slightly broken but still repairable, we encourage you to check out the Hennepin County Fix-It Clinics. We can talk more about that later if you have questions. Those happen once a month. There's actually one in St. Louis Park on May 9th uh, that, at the rec center. And the last option, if it's just not repairable, would be the trash. The next category of things is dirty or full stuff. And what I mean by this is stuff that's contaminated with food or full of liquids. This bottle here was from a sort we did and it was still full of Gatorade. These types of items become contamination in everything. So if this bottle opens up, it contaminates everything else. These yogurt containers, especially dairy-based things, can get really nice and moldy, especially in August at a sorting facility, so we don't want that. So the main thing that we need is things to be emptied and clean. This up here is an example we found actually um, in a s internal city thing. People weren't sure we had a I don't know project and this was something and as you can see it's full of utensils and food and napkins. When things are like that they are never going to get sorted correctly and it's just going to be a contaminant. Uh, the other thing I will just put up here for if you have questions afterward is sort of a dirty versus clean enough. 
It doesn't necessarily have to be pristine, reusable, but it does need to be clean enough that it's not gonna make a mess of the system. So pizza boxes are a big one we get, for example, super greasy like this, or if there's any food in there, needs to be, they can actually go in the organics or trash. Otherwise, they need to be pretty clean. The last one, and as Kayla mentioned, you'll get a PDF of this, so please don't try to read all of this. It will be useful when you can see it up close. Is when it comes to plastics, numbers matter. And what I mean by that is a lot of people tell us, oh, but it had, it had the recycling symbol on it. It has to be recyclable. Unfortunately, that's not a recycling symbol. It's what's called a resin ID code. It is the chasing arrows of the recycling symbol with a number inside. Unfortunately, this has been in place for a really long time. It's caused a lot of confusion. But this number simply indicates the type of plastic from which that item is made. So you can see at the top here, there are seven categories. And they are various things. This is what they're generally, where you see them. And the thing is, is that recycling, as much as we like to talk about it from an environmental perspective, is largely a business, right? You have to have somebody at the other end who wants to buy those materials in order for it to be recyclable. If no one wants to buy it and there's not enough demand, it's not going to be recyclable. So this is why we do not accept number three, number six, and number seven in our program. This is pretty universal across the Twin Cities metro, so whether you work in another community or live in a multifamily building, this is the same for any community here in the Twin Cities metro. The most common ones you're gonna see are ones and twos. So keep that in mind when it comes to plastics. All right, so now we get into the specific categories that we talked about. The first one is aerosols. These are an issue because of safety. Their contents under pressure, and they also typically will contain chemicals or contents that might be harmful to people's health if they come into contact with them when they're not using them. So where should these things go? If those aerosol cans are empty, they can be brought to a scrap metal recycler or they can go in the trash. But if they're partial or full, they should be brought to one of Hennepin County's drop-off facilities or their HHW events, which stands for Household Hazardous Waste. They hold those events throughout Hennepin County in different cities. We typically always have one here in St. Louis Park in the summer. The one this year will be on June 12th and 13th, and it's gonna be at St. Louis Park High School, which typically it's been at the middle school. This year it's gonna be at the high school. You'll hear us mention the county drop-off facility a few times throughout the presentation, as well as some other resources. And at the end of our presentation, there will be a slide that lists links to those resources. And we're going to have a table outside the door here with some pamphlets. So you'll be able to grab that to get more info on, on those drop-off options. The next thing is batteries. Hopefully you saw that in the video that batteries really can cause a lot of damage for being such a, a little thing. Any type of battery should be recycled, but it can't go in your regular recycling bin. The county's drop-off facilities in Brooklyn Park and Bloomington will take any type of rechargeable button, flashlight battery, or sealed lead acid battery. The sealed lead acid batteries, the, those that are pictured on the right there, can also be brought to a scrap metal recycler for recycling. Clothing is another one of those things that we don't want people to just throw it in the trash, but it doesn't belong mixed in with the regular recycling. It becomes one of those operational issues, gets tangled around the equipment in a recycling facility. So instead of putting it in your recycling cart, if it's still usable, we suggest that you donate it to your favorite local charity. You can participate in a clothing swap. They're held throughout the Twin Cities all all the time, you can just look on Facebook or look online for an event. We have been holding an event here in St. Louis Park for a couple of years now, and our 2020 event is on July 12th over at The Rock, and it's gonna be held in conjunction with the city's uh, garage sale as well. Another option is the city's orange bag program that's offered through Simple Recycling. So if you live in a single family home and have the city service, you can put usable clothing in those bags as well. It does need to be set out at the front curb, regardless of where you have collection, on your recycling week. 
And just one thing to note, the Orange Bag program is not a donation program. It is a for-profit company that collects them. So if that's important to you, just make sure to find your favorite charity to donate to it instead. Torn and worn clothing has options other than the trash. So you could repurpose it, cut it up and use it as rags around the house. There are also some creative reuse options here that uh, Emily is actually the creative genius behind some of these. Yeah. So she's brought in some cool examples of how you can repurpose a t-shirt into a, a reusable shopping tote or a reusable bag. And, uh, jeans into Christmas and then yep. these are I, I'm a cat person so I turn missing socks the other pair into cat toys and things like that so yeah some so examples. it's it's a place where you can let your creativity run wild but if you don't have the time or the means to create something new you can also use the orange bag program for torn and worn stuff the one thing we want you to keep in mind is that for clothing recycling markets also kind of matter the same way they do for our regular recyclables. So clothing that has paint or stain stains or tar stains on it, those really aren't recyclable. The tiny little scraps of fabric from quilting and sewing, those really don't have a market. For the most part, they're really looking for cotton and denim type clothing for recycling. The next one, diapers. Yes, these show up at the MRFs and they are a contamination and safety issue for obvious reasons, coming into contact with workers or contaminating materials that we want to recycle, so they should go in the trash. The next category is dish and drinkware, and this was mentioned in the video. The main reason is, so ceramics and porcelain just don't match. They're, they're very different materials. They're not the same as glass. People often ask, though, about like glasses, like a wine glass or a drinking glass. This is a different type of glass than your single use glass bottle that you might get a soda in or a, or a juice. It's a different type of glass, it melts at a different temperature, and so unfortunately it's a contaminant in with the glass recycling. Any sort of reusable drinking container or dishware, plates and things, do need to go in the garbage if they're broken. If they're usable, we encourage you to donate them, give them away, there's lots of thrift store options for those. The next category is electronics. This is a safety and contamination issue. As you saw, anything with a battery, so most electronics, they can, they can cause those problems. The other issue is things like this, the old CRTs, those actually have leaded glass, so when that glass gets broken, that leaded glass then becomes a contaminant in the regular glass as well. That's really not wanted. Unfortunately, we still see, especially the smaller electronics <coughs> like phones in the recycling quite often. So please do not put those in your recycling container. That said, they do all need to be recycled. There are some laws that require certain things, most of them to be recycled. Uh, and because of that, there are actually a decent number of opportunities to get rid of them correctly. The first thing is our city cleanups. We have two of these a year in June and in September. So you can bring any of these items to those events. Many of the smaller items are free. A lot of the other items have a small charge. The other place you can take them is the Hennepin County drop-offs. We always encourage people to go there. They're open about 300 days a year, uh, even including some weekends. And they will, they actually have some of the better, like the less cost. So like TVs are much cheaper to take there than there are even to our cleanup. So we encourage people to utilize the Hennepin County facilities. The last thing is there are a number of retailers that are obligated under state law to collect recyclable or electronics, so like Best Buy. There are also some companies like TechDump that recycle those as part of their business model. And so those are a couple of other good opportunities. Next category is flat plastic lids. <laughs> this, they come off of coffee cans and all sorts of things. Unfortunately, things in a MRF sort based on 3D and 2D um, aspects as the first kind of way. And the most of the 2D objects are paper and cardboard. And so those things are sorted out early on. And unfortunately, things like a flat plastic lid from a coffee can ends up getting sorted like paper, and so it becomes a contaminant in our paper. Three-dimensional plastics, like bottles and such, go through the system and are sorted later. So unfortunately, things like this or other flat items, as we'll talk about in a few minutes, end up as a contaminant. So those should go in the garbage. Flexible and multi-layer packaging. There's no easy way to like condense that name, so there it is. This is very similar to the flat lids. These things, 
move through the system like paper, and they end up as a contaminant in paper. So these should all go in the garbage. It includes the number of items pictured here, as well as snack bags, you, know, you get granola and any of that type of stuff. The big issue here, and we'll talk about plastic film in a few minutes, is a lot of these have multiple types of plastic for different to provide different characteristics. So they might have a couple different types of plastic or foil, like Capri Sun, it's aluminum involved. And so they just don't have good options, even like in the, bag, the retail options. So let's talk about food. Food in the recycling is a contamination issue, especially for paper and cardboard. When it comes into contact with food, that's really gonna cause issues with the quality of that material. But as, oh, Emily mentioned earlier, we do have options for food. We really want to see that stuff out of the trash. And the city has an organics program, a curbside organics program for single family households. There are also several drop off options for folks who live in apartments or multifamily buildings. And you can participate in those programs and take food um, that, that uh, you know, leftovers and that sort of thing and keep them out of your trash by composting them through those programs or through backyard composting. The thing that I skipped over that we want you to think of first before even composting is using it up. There are a lot of great ideas out there on the internet for creating great meals out of leftovers and for thinking about where you're storing food in your refrigerator to make sure that the food that you do have is lasting longer and not spoiling too quickly. So a great resource is savethefood.org and uh, they have some ideas there on, on how you can extend the life of the food you have. But the organics program, like I mentioned, is an option. We will have some resources out here if you are interested in signing up for those programs after the presentation is over. Otherwise, if those aren't options that you're going to take, then food needs to go in the trash rather than in the recycling. Freezer boxes and containers that come from your freezer, if you can think of it in this way, if you buy it from the freezer section and you store it in your freezer at home, these are all items that are manufactured in a way with either a chemical or a plastic layer that helps that package maintain its integrity during freeze and thaw as you're purchasing and storing the food, but it results in um, material that the MRFs really don't want mixed in with their paper bales or cardboard. It devalues that good material. So our recyclers don't want freezer boxes, ice cream tubs in the recycling. They're a contaminant for that reason. So instead they need to go in the trash. The next thing we want to talk about is medication and pill bottles. Medication is a contaminant for a couple of different reasons. Either it's a bottle that's filled with medication, so they don't want that going in the recycling, or it's typically a pill bottle. Even if it's empty, it's not going to pass that two inch minus that Emily was talking about earlier. Those pill bottles are typically pretty small, so if they, they are not greater than two inches in height, two inches in diameter, they're not gonna make it through the recycling system. So what we, suggest you do instead those bottles that still have medication in them instead of throwing them in the trash and definitely not pouring medications down the toilet they really should be brought to an approved drop-off facility hennepin county has lots of these throughout the county and st louis park actually has a fairly new drop-off box in our police department lobby it's open 24 hours a day for you to drop those medications off Empty bottles, if they don't meet that two inch rule, then those should go in the trash. Napkins, paper towels, face, facial tissues, um, it's deceiving. Paper towels means it's made out of paper, right? Shouldn't it go in the recycling? But actually, these materials are made out of a low grade fiber that the recyclers don't want. Napkins and paper towels end up as a contaminant with the paper at the recycling facility. Instead of trashing it, you could join the organics program or, or put that in the organics if you already participate. Otherwise, those items should go in the trash. The next category is paper food service packaging. This includes cups, plates, takeout containers. 
Much like the freezer boxes, these often have a layer of plastic or other material to give them some sort of moisture barrier. Because of that, they end up as a contaminant. The other issue is that they often are covered with food, right? These are look very clean, but they usually have grease or your milkshake or things like that, leftovers. Uh, and the recyclers just really don't want that material. In St. Louis Park, we have our zero waste packaging ordinance that does require restaurants, other food vendors to use compostable or recyclable food service items. So you will see cups around St. Louis Park that have this logo on it, or they might say compostable. Those items can go in the organics program. We want to really look for that logo, especially on things like cups. But those items have a special lining that's made out of a specific type of plastic that's compostable. It's usually made from corn, and those can go in the organics. If it's not certified or you're unsure, please do put those items in the trash. Next, our friend plastic bags and film. If you didn't already get this from the video a few times, these can never ever ever go in your curbside uh, recycling or if you're multifamily in the dumpster there. These unfortunately cause a lot of downtime at MRFs. Most MRFs on average shut down a couple of hours a day to clean plastic bags out of their spinning material, which is called a star screen. And if you look online or you saw some pictures, they have to lock the machines for safety. Their staff have to get in the, work, in the machinery and are either using you know, X-Acto knives or sometimes I've seen videos where they actually use like a, an electric saw type of a situation. It's not safe for f folks to have to be doing that and it's costing you money, right? So that downtime costs us money on our contract with the city or with the hauler and then that costs you money in your rates. So the more we can keep those bags out of there, the better it is for all of us. The best option for bags like grocery bags are to reuse them. If you do get them and you avo can't avoid them in the first place, is to reuse them. Whether it's for you know, pet waste or a garbage can, reuse those bags. The next option is store drop-off. A few little side notes, they do need to be clean and dry and they need to be the correct type. So going back to like the freezer bags and some of those, the, the other plastic certain snack bags, those are not the correct type of bag. So you do need to just make sure you're following that. If, we have a little handout out there that's got the specific types that are okay. Otherwise, they do need to go in the garbage. The next category, and this always blows my mind that they see so many of these, are propane tanks. You would guess that people would understand that this is really dangerous, but unfortunately, the haulers see a lot of the little one pound camping uh, propane tanks, a lot of them. And so it's really, really important that these never go in your recycling. They, again, do need to be properly disposed. They also shouldn't go in your trash because they're also a safety issue in the garbage. Those trucks are also compacting your trash and an empty gas cylinder that may not be quite <coughs> empty can be a problem. So these should not go in the recycling or your trash. The little one pounders can go to Hennepin County drop off facilities and the larger ones either need to go back to the retail location where you purchase them, like the hardware stores or gas stations, or there's a company in Minneapolis called Lakes Gas that will take them anytime. The next category is scrap metal. This is a safety issue for a few different reasons. I don't have it pictured here, but sometimes what happens is people will put long pieces of pipe and through those conveyor belts and other things, those become like projectiles, right? High velocity projectiles in a system like that is not a good situation. Also, this here, the rotary saw blade, that was in a sort from St. Louis Park Recycling last year. So this is incredibly dangerous for folks working. In it. Those conveyor belts are moving like seven miles an hour. These types of things are not gonna work in the system. It's an operational issue, it's a safety issue. But again, most of them can actually be recycled. If you have our curbside program, you can put things in a separate box, like your old recycling totes, if you still have those, or cardboard box next to your recycling container. And the hauler has a special box on their truck that they can put those things in for metal recycling. If you don't wanna do that, or you live in multifamily, there are a number of, um, you can bring them to the city cleanups, or there are scrap metal recyclers that will, will take those items as well. Sharps and needles, those are things that 
uh, I think we saw in the video, it's obviously a, a hazard to people who are working in the facility. If they see a sharp come across the line, they shut down the entire line, they have to remove it, you know, look to see if there, there are any other sharps along with it. It causes a number of issues and is a safety issue. And actually, it is illegal to put sharps in the recycling in the state of Minnesota. In order to keep you safe as you're using them and um, safe for safety at the drop-off facilities who actually accept sharps, you want to make sure to always keep them in a puncture-proof container. The milk jug pictured is not a puncture-proof container. You want a, a thicker plastic laundry detergent jug is a good option or an approved biohazard plastic box. The county drop-offs will take sharps in those puncture-proof containers. There are mail-back programs and also devices that would allow you to destroy the sharp at home. The last resort is always to put it in the trash. While that's allowed, it really isn't a preferred reason, just for the fact that there is more of a potential for it to be coming into contact with those workers. Of course, it does always have to be in a puncture-proof container. You could never put sharps loose into the trash. There's a website here that you can go to that gives you some more options for safe sharps and needle disposal. The next thing that you've heard about a couple of times now is shredded paper. And it's something that we used to accept in our program. You could put it in a brown paper bag and close it up. But what they were finding at the MRFs is even with taking those precautions, actually what was happening is the collection, compaction, and then dumping, scooping, and moving it along the conveyor that bag just was not keeping shredded paper inside it. It was essentially being shared with the entire facility and mixed in with all of the different recyclables. In this picture here, you can see it's all over the, the floor next to the sorting line. And the little red circle up top is like a little nest of shredded paper that ended up up top. That's just to illustrate how mobile it is when it gets into a sorting facility. And it really is impossible for it to be cleaned up out of the other recyclables. It just doesn't end up getting recycled if you put it in. Within the last couple of years, made that decision to take that off of our acceptable list. There are other options though for shredded paper. First, what we'd like you to think about is limiting the amount of paper that you shred. Documents that have your name and address on them, on them really do not need to be shredded. Think more of sensitive documents like bank, tax, credit cards, health uh, healthcare statements, and the like. Those things shred. If you have already shredded paper, you can bring that to the city cleanup events. We'll take it if it's already shredded. We'll also take paper and documents that ha have not been yet shredded take paper for shredding to another event. There are banks throughout the community that will take paper for shredding um, or businesses that accept paper for shredding, but there is a, a cost. There are a couple of places locally in St. Louis Park that will take it and there's a price per pound. The last option, if you've shredded paper, you're not able to bring it to one of our events, would be to put that in the trash. We do not take shredded paper in our organics program and that's because the ink that is printed on paper has plastic in that toner and they do not want that at the composting facilities. So string lights, extension cords that are made out of wire are our next category. And these are an operational issue. Again, one of those tanglers that can end up wound around uh, the sorting machinery. And so instead, you should bring those to the city cleanup events. We take them free of charge at the cleanups. You can bring them to the county drop-off facilities or to a scrap metal recycler. And a very last resort would be to put them in the trash. Styrofoam. Styrofoam is plastic. It's a polystyrene, a number six. If you remember the nice table that Emily had up earlier, uh, this is a type of plastic that just does not have market. It's very light. Um, and can break apart and can become a contaminant at the recycling facility. This type of material, whether it's a styrofoam cup or the what's pictured there is packaging maybe around a TV or some other consumer product that you take out of a box, that really needs to go into the trash. It's not accepted in the recycling. Next category, and unfortunately we see a lot of these in our recycling sorts, is plastic utensils and straws. While they are made of plastic, 
they don't move through the system correctly. As we mentioned, the, it has to do with the different dimensions and just the way that things get sorted, so they end up as a contaminant in the glass. The other issue is a lot of times they're made out of that same polystyrene, that number six plastic, so at least the utensils, even if they could be captured, often wouldn't be recyclable anyway. And so we do want to see these only go in the garbage. A couple of notes. On January, as of January 1st, and please note that we know not all restaurants are fully doing this yet, but we did change our zero waste packaging ordinance to require that restaurants only provide straws upon request. So you may have seen that in a few restaurants already. Uh, fast food places where they have it out in a dispenser, that meets the requirement, but sit down restaurants, they should not be providing a straw right away unless you request it. The idea behind this is it's still available for folks who need and prefer that, which is totally fine and great, but we want to try to opt and think about waste prevention and try to limit and just decrease so then we hopefully don't see as many of these in the recycling or just in general. Next we have wrapping paper, and this is a category that we, different communities, it's kind of, this is one of the few that's not totally universal around the Twin Cities Metro, but in St. Louis Park, we don't want it. Uh, our holler here does not have an interest in it because it tends to be a pretty low grade fiber. It's, especially on tissue paper, it's already been recycled a few times and it's just not a valuable thing. So again, it downgrades the value of their paper. And so these do need to go in the garbage. A few things to think about is if you do use a recyclable option, say like a newspaper or an old map, which are two of my favorite things, those would be recyclable. But the other issue is, is that it needs to still be flat, right? We talked about how things move through the system. So if you're opening up a birthday gift and you crumple that all up, it's not going to move through the system correctly. So it's a little bit tricky. You gotta, it's a behavior change in a couple ways if you wanna have a recyclable option, but that's just something to think about. The last category are six pack tops. And this has come up more and more because a bunch of, a lot of, especially craft brewers are moving away from the rings and are moving to these. These are definitely recyclable, just not in our curbside program. Again, because they're flat and they move through the system wrong. There are in the last couple of years, a number of craft brewers in particular that have started collecting these. Steel Toe here in St. Louis Park offers that and many of them offer an incentive uh, and a beverage when you come in and bring in however many of these or a discount on your, on your purchase. So that's something to just note. If you want to recycle these, you do need to collect them and just take them to somewhere that actually accepts them. Other option, they do need to go in the garbage. A couple of little notes, and this is where my waste prevention hat gets comes out, is thinking about how do we avoid wish cycling. So we have all the we have this nice guide now, and you can take this home with you as a guide. But one of the best ways to avoid wish cycling is to just avoid these types of things in the first place, right? Avoid the single-use items that we don't really need in the first place. Uh, a few examples, of course, are utensils, reusable tote bags, and that last picture is actually some reusable gift wrap. This is, or gift bags, cloth gift bags. Some really great, easy ways to just avoid these things. A lot of people say, well, I want to recycle as much as I can. A great way to not have to deal with throwing these things in the trash is to avoid them. Now, one thing I want to note, things like utensils, you do not have to go out online or at a store and buy a brand new set. Like, you have utensils at home. You can just put a set in your car, like put a little baggie, put them in your car. You don't have to go and buy brand new things um, for, to do this. You can utilize things you already have. In fact, those t-shirt totes like I made here make great gift bags, right? You can use them, wrap it up, tie, this, tie the top together and make it into a gift bag. Have it be part of the gift. The other thing is to think about is just buying quality durable goods. I realize this is sort of a hard thing to do sometimes. In certain categories, things are just designed to to break faster, right? They just don't make things. But to do some research and think about, especially when it comes to clothing and textiles and, and toys, to think about that and avoiding things that are gonna have to be disposed quickly anyway. A few notes on what we're doing around recycling and education in addition to things like this workshop and ways that we would love for you to spread the word to your family and friends and neighbors. We send out an annual recycling guide. The last one was in the fall, our parks perspective. As we say, stick to the guide. If it's not on the guide, either co connect with us, I'll show our email address here in a second, connect with us and ask or throw it away with, the, with few exceptions like electronics and things like that. The other thing we do is we try to put articles in the park perspective on a fairly regular basis around recycling, specific education. If you have our curbside program, use these carts. Some people don't like these, uh, but we think of them as a great educational opportunity. The idea is to help 
<laughs> inform folks about what we'd like to see and what we'd prefer not to see. Not that we want you to be in trouble or think, feel bad about it, but it's an educational opportunity for everybody. So you may occasionally see one of these if you have one of those items in your cart. We put out a good amount of information on social media, so if you are on any of the uh, Facebook, Nextdoor, or Twitter, the city uses all of those to do education around recycling. We have an email list. Uh, we send those not super frequently, but frequently enough um, you get good information. We also have a program called Recycling Champions. I know we have a couple in the room tonight. This is a citizen-based group. We do education through the city, additional education. It's a way for you to be an ambassador in the community to take information like this and to intentionally share it with your neighbors, your co-workers, your anything. And it's a great way to get involved. We have volunteer opportunities throughout the year that we uh, engage folks with. As Kayla mentioned, a few resources in addition to the ones that were kind of embedded in the presentation. These are a few. Again, you'll get this. You don't have to write these down. We have information on our website. The Hennepin Green Disposal Guide is a fantastic resource. This is kind of an A to Z guide. You can put in all sorts of things and say, what do I do with this? And they'll tell you if the county takes it or if there's another option um, where, where it can go. And then they do have the collection events all listed there in case you can't make the St. Louis Park one. There are others you can attend. At this time, we have 10 minutes for questions, so we would be happy to entertain those. As Kayla mentioned, we'd like to start off if there are any specific items that we can like say, hey, this, and we'll answer those quickly, and then we can get into deeper questions. So, so, the, paper so the paper grocery bags was the question. Those are recyclable. It's just that we don't want recyclables in them. One thing to note, if they're in good condition, please consider taking them to step, because they always like to have grocery bags for handing out uh, food. Let's see here. We had one up here, I think. Go ahead. I recycle a lot of stuff. So, so the question is, where do you get rid of circuit boards from other things you may have dis like taken apart, disassembled? And the county will take all of those. Also, Tech Dump, the one I mentioned, they will take circuit boards. Um, and I believe most of the time, if you've already disassembled it, you can, you can do that for free. One thing I want to note, smoke detectors, don't disassemble those. They contain a, a chemical um, that's slightly radioactive, actually. And as I learned through my own research, you shouldn't be disassembling those. They actually should just go in the garbage. It's kind of counterintuitive. Remove the battery, and those should go in the garbage. But everything else, vacuum cleaners, other things, you can take those. There are certain things like electric power tools that the county will just take whole. But they take a lot of, a lot of things. Best Buy actually takes a number of things, too. So the question is about air, the air pillows. Those are definitely recyclable in those programs at the retail stores. Please deflate them, puncture them, and then uh, take them to those grocery stores. So on the little handout there, Cub, Trader Joe's, Buyer Lee's, Target, they all have, have with your plastic bags along with a number of other things. One thing to note when it comes to like packaging materials, it's a great thing to post on next door to see if people or, or community places, a lot of people are looking for that, especially around the end of the month when they're moving. Um, and I've gotten, I don't know if I've ever had to recycle packaging materials because I always just give it away that way. So let's see, we had, to, okay, we had one here, you were. We got a few things. So, okay, we'll try to do these. To yeah, so this is uh, polypropylene number five. These are trash. I don't care that they say I'm recyclable. That is not correct. <laughs> The plastic film, they pretty much just want number two and number four. Uh, cottage cheese container, this is a number five, so that would be okay. It's nice and clean. It feels like a styrofoam um, they have a, There's a wrap on this, I'm pretty sure, but that's okay. The lids on these types of things are trash. Um, it is foil. You can recycle like aluminum foil that's pretty clean, but this is just okay. too small. It's never going to end up in the right system. Like where you get labels yeah. or stamps. Yeah, I always say those. trash. Exactly. This type of thing, usually there's a plastic involved, and it's such a thin uh, type, low quality, low grade paper. It's uh, trash. So. Correct. So the question is if milk cartons should be flattened. That was the thing that they had asked us to do previously, but what they found is they move through the system. We want them to move like a two, a 3D object, not a 2D object anymore. So le you can leave the cap on. Please rinse them. Put the cap back on and put them in three dimensional. Let's see here. Or, okay. Uh, our recycler does not require us to have residents remove labels on the plastic bags, or I'm sorry, on on 
tin cans or on plastic bottles, um, at least right now. I mean, I think if you are super conscious and you would like to take the time to do that, that's great. The plastic wrap on a plastic bottle, however, would need to go in the trash. And the paper on a steel, just so you know, on, on a tin can, if you leave it on, it's not going to get recycled. What'll happen is it'll get sorted with the steel and when they process that, it'll burn up in the steel making process, steel recycling process, so. So the question has to do with lids. Basically, the main one we tell people is if it's a plastic lid on a plastic container, you can leave those. Plastic on glass is never gonna get recycled. Um, the one exception would be metal lids on glass are generally okay because they'll be picked up by a magnet, um, but all the plastic lids on glass need to go in the garbage. Yep, in the very back. So the question is if you have a bunch of flat lids or somebody will ask about like a bunch of tiny little plastic things, can I put them in another plastic container? There are two challenges with this. One, if they're not all the same type of plastic and you can't verify that, then you're gonna have contamination because you're gonna have a mix of plastics. The other issue is the way that plastics are sorted is through a piece of equipment called an optical sorter. That optical sorter relies on those items being empty because it uses air and puffs of air to sort them and to get them in the right place. We can send a video out when we include this of how that works. It's really pretty cool actually. Um, but it, like the one that was full of liquid, if you have a plastic container that's full of a bunch of other stuff, that puff of air is not going to push it where it needs to. So plastic containers need to be empty. Um, let's see here, over here. So the question about aluminum foil. Aluminum foil can be recycled, asterisk, if it's clean enough, if it's pretty clean. So if it was like over a really messy lasagna and it's full of cheese, that's garbage. But if it was like you know, a plate of cookies and it's still pretty clean. The other thing is, is it needs to be about the size of a tennis ball. So if it's smaller than that, it gets to be that too small. So one thing you may have to do is just have a ball of aluminum foil building in your kitchen. And when it's big enough, you know, it's like the size of a grapefruit or bigger than you put it in there. Let's see here. Yeah. So the question has to do with packaging, like, or even you get a box in the mail, right? And it's got tape. So the the paper mills have figured out a way to sort out that plastic tape and get it out. If you can remove it, it's preferred. It's be always best to remove the plastic tape. Um, the staples, they're, they're, they're gonna get sorted out in the pulping process. So always when you can remove that, the same thing with like little plastic bits on the tissue boxes, right? If you can remove that plastic, it's better. The paper pulpers have figured out how to remove that, but it's always better to remove the extra contaminants. Um, but we recognize that not everyone is going to do that. Let's see here. So with, with alkaline batteries, so if they say alkaline, those can safely be placed in the trash. There are no longer any um, toxic materials. That said, the county will accept them for recycling. There are programs to recycle. So it's kind of one of those things, but anything that's nickel cadmium, lithium, lithium uh, nickel metal hydride, and NMIH, those should all be recycled. Yep. Okay, we have time for like two more questions. Yeah, so the question about expired fire extinguishers, and I just told Kayla this yesterday, the St. Louis Park Fire Department will take expired fire extinguishers, which I did not know until this last year. So. At the fire station? At the fire station, yep. yep. This is our information here, um, our direct contact, plus we have a general email address, the recycling at stlouispark.org. If you ever are out and about and find something and want to send us an email, you can take a picture and send it to us there. We'll get back to you uh, as soon as we can. So thank you so much for coming. Sorry, I forgot about that.